Mr. Hoffman. It's interesting because I've um, constantly changing the presentation of what I'm going to talk about in terms of Buddha Dharma several times, uh, including the last five or ten minutes. Chan is this way we we are constantly adjusting to the appearances so that I measure the group to see what their capability is, what that I in my heart believe that would be useful to this group to uh, advance your practice. I could go very deep into discussing Buddha Dharma, but I would lose quite a few of you and you would not obtain a benefit. On the other hand, simply reciting what you know already is useless. You, you at this point are beyond the ABCs. So you have to keep going with that and to advance your practice. You should not be satisfied with where you're at, but you should be inquisitive, pushing the practice, wanting to know more. So this morning, maybe you obtained a little taste of what mind can be, what mind how quiet mind can be. We put that aside and we practice anew. Every single time when we sit to meditate, we use the beginner's mind, never thinking of what we've already accomplished, where we're at, or try to reach some point we've been before. Each time we sit is a new opportunity to uh, investigate Chan. And we do not um, base our practice or should not base our practice on what we've experienced before. The one thing that I know about the practice is, is that it's constantly redefining itself, exploring different aspects of mind. You never reach the edge of mind. It's always further and further away, infinite. And yet, when you sit to practice, you are comfortable in the fact that it is infinite. We cannot know that. No one can know. Infinite means there's no end. It is a way of of describing what cannot be described, what not, cannot be conceived of, which is mind. When we make useless efforts to try to identify mind, we are further from it. When you sit, as you sat this morning, in quiet contemplation, mind absorbs you. And there's a quietness there. Less attention to your body, less attention to the thoughts. A stillness, yet mind is present dynamically. And when you get up off the cushion, it's demonstrated in your actions with each step you take. You are aware. This awareness is mine. We don't know that. We don't understand that. But if we use it, we're not far from it. Why? Because it's our intrinsic nature. In the practice of Chan, throughout the historical development of Mahayana Chan, Mahayana being the great vehicle, Yana's vehicle, Maha means great vehicle, the Chan school belongs to Mahayana, as does the Tibetan school. 
and this great vehicle emphasizes what is called ekayana. So try to remember these terms, or at least the concepts of these terms. I want to take your practice to a higher level, a more sophisticated level, a level that you're able to become more interested. That's how it works. Now, you can go and you can buy a computer and have somebody install programs for you or do whatever or take out the viruses for you, but you never know how it works. But imagine if you understand how, how the computer works. Then you can do anything with a computer. It is this practice that we, we practice in this way. Ekayana means one mind. One mind, meaning that there's not many minds. You do not have individual minds. You only have the Buddha mind. But it, that's not bad. That's good news, not bad news. Because even having the Buddha mind, you're free, you have a choice to express it. And you express it in samsara. You have the interest of taking care of others. This is Mahayana. Why? Because the mind that you use is the mind that other people use. Their suffering then is your suffering because the minds are all joined. How could the suffering of one illusory sentient being dreaming in this world not be your concern. It is why you find me sitting here before you today, because this is a demonstration of mind and the power of mind and the vows, the bodhisattva vows. A bodhisattva is also more of a convention of Mahayana than it was from the Theravadan. Before, a bodhisattva was, was uh, connected with uh, the development of Shakyamuni Buddha, the historical Buddha's development towards enlightenment. Mahayana came and said, all of you possess Buddha nature. This is ekayana. And that it is not something to attain. It is something simply to realize. When you practice in this way, how could you not see others as Buddhas? You see things in this way. Master Ling Chi said, even the bodhisattvas, Sometimes their viewpoint is faulted. Because if you ask a bodhisattva, are you a Buddha, they will hesitate. They, their faith is not complete. They will not deem themselves to be a bodhisattva. Excuse me, a Buddha, only a bodhisattva. But in fact, by the power of their vows, there should be a complete faith that all sentient beings, all Buddhas, all patriarchs, all have the same mind, the Buddha mind. When you can see people in this way, it's not blasphemous. It's not pretentious. It is just as it is, it is something that's very wondrous. I once was in uh, Jinsong, um, the, the headquarters of DDM uh, in, um, in Taiwan, and there were different people that were speaking uh, to this uh, entire assembly. So a few thousand people were in attendance. And they're all saying something, and I was thinking, 
to myself were all lined up to, to say something in the front of the group. I went, what am I going to say? Because if I say something, people have already said that. It, it, I sh shouldn't just say something shallow. There, there has to be something. But I, what, what should I say? And as I was thinking like that, then the, um, the, the moderator taps me on the shoulder and hands me the microphone. But wait, I'm not finished. I haven't thought of what I'm going to say. And, and in my heart, I wanted to say something true, not egotistical, but true, something to help people. And in that moment, something very strange happened. So I started and I said, I want to thank, and I was going to say, the Abbott president, uh, Kuo Hui. And I went, I want to thank, no, wait a minute. And then I saw everybody in the assembly, they were all Buddhas. Every single person in that room was a Buddha. And I was just looking at Buddhas. It, it was so amazing, but, but so dumbfounding at the same time. And, and I said, I want to thank you all for coming here, all of you Buddhas, because each one of you is a Buddha. And I just started talking very sincerely because it was just simply the vision that I saw that everyone was this way, and the mind was testifying to Ekayana, to this single mind. When we sit, this is the way we should sit. With the Buddha mind, we already have it. We don't need to look for it. It is what all the ancient masters talk about and, and exhort you to do and try to keep you from, from practicing in a way that's inconsistent with ekayana, with this just mind. The idea of just mind was an important development in Buddha Dharma. It was a clarification of what was from before and saying that everyone possesses intrinsically, intrinsically means within them already, Buddha Dharma. It's as if I just told all of you, every one of you has DNA. Would anybody here dispute that? No, because intrinsically DNA is within you. The problem that we have, we don't understand our own DNA. We, don't, we take this meat puppet that sits in here and we think it's that DNA. But it's not. You have the DNA of the noble lineage. It's already within you. If you practice in this way, then your practice and your meditation will be fruitful. You will take care of your brothers and sisters because they are not other than Buddha mind as well. How could you not do that to take care of the, the novices in this way? There's a, a sutra called the, the Sutra of, of Demonstration of the Inconceivable uh, Mind of Buddhahood. And in this one, Subhuti, which was one of um, Shakyamuni Buddha's disciples, was listening to an exchange between Manjushri and the Buddha. And they were going back and forth and back and forth. Manjushri here, he understood. He was a bodhisattva that truly knew his roots, his DNA. And so... The Buddha had asked Manjushri, Manjushri, can it be said that you have attained the state uh, of a bodhisattva? And he said, world honored one, if you have attained that state, 
then so have I. And the Buddha said, isn't it true that such states are just delusions and they're un unattainable? And he says, well, then that's it. So he was asking him if he had attained also the state of Buddhahood. It goes on. If he had attained the state of Buddhahood. And Sabuti's so trying to watch this conversation because, because the Buddha was trying to trap Manjusri into saying that he had attained. But Manjusri was saying, turning it back on him, saying, if you have attained the state of Buddhahood, then, then I've attained the state of a bodhisattva. And he said, but that's not the way it is. It, and so then Subhuti was scratching his head. And he said, Manjusri, with all this high talk, high level discussion, you're not taking care of the novice. You, the novice. You're not taking care of them. And Manjusri said to Sabuti, suppose Sabuti, if you were ill and you go to the doctor, would it be wise of the doctor to prescribe you sweet honey and candy for your illness or the bitter medicine that will heal you? And Sabuti said, of course, the bitter medicine. Anybody who's had Chinese medicine know what I'm talking about. It's very, very bitter. <laughs> if it doesn't kill you, it heals you. But he said, of course, it has to be, uh, you, you have to take the, the bitter medicine. And he said, so it is with the Dharma, that by, by just giving people sweet talk, what good is that? It does not heal them. But having them take the bitter medicine, then they have an opportunity to practice correctly. So when I speak about things that are more profound, it is the elixir, the medicine that you need to, to take you to the next level of practice away from just simply sitting and practicing your legs. No one that I know of has a achieved enlightenment by simply crossing their legs. I don't want you to come here for that. Shufu, he used to say to the people at the retreats, he would look at everybody, tell me, did you come here to practice your legs or practice the Dharma? Because there's people that were very, very good. They could sit so like a stone lion all the time, sitting like a stone lion. But their, their regular daily practice did not reflect any kind of a, a great insight. And in fact, if people who have uh, some abilities were to stand behind the people, Sometimes you see the master standing behind the student sitting. Anybody see Master Shenyang do that? Anybody? Nobody? He would sit, stand behind the people. He would see. It, if you stand behind the person, some people, it would just be like, mm -hmm. and you could sit, stand behind somebody that had their legs crossed for an hour, and you'd hear, you would know this person, even though they look like a stone lion inside, it's a, a giant pity party or whatever it is that they're engaging in. There's not a true quietness there. The true quietness comes from, from practicing in the proper way. Practicing with wisdom, this wisdom that's sealed by samadhi, just being still. And the wisdom is actually not really wisdom at all. It is just 
encountering mind. One of my uh, senior students, I guess I can call him a senior student now, was telling me, sometimes when he sits, he sees that there is um, somebody sitting and thinking. And what is that? And I said, it is your true nature looking on essentially the reflection on the pond and your projection of self is being seen by mind. It appears as though the mind has split into two because when you run into this, you don't know what that means. You have never had that experience. But all of a sudden, there's a distance there between the, um, the appearances and, and something that's observing. That is the mind's own perception, seeing what is appearing, including your own ego. This is a good condition as long as you don't stay there. It is just something to pass through, but, but it requires a quietness, a proper way of practicing in order to get to there. You are all capable of doing that. But it is this mind's own perception, the perception of, of uh, Avalokitesvara, perceived that all five skandha are empty, didn't use the perception of the five skanda, but use the, the mind's perception. Today, when you were sitting in meditation, you were using the mind's own perception. It is why everything became very quiet, very smooth, very clear. For that moment, you were transported, let's say, your perception was transported by turning the mind's eye inward to see. It is not a duality. It is just the knowing aspect of mind seeing what is reflected on its surface. We practice in this way, and there can be progress made. One of the things that um, sometimes I see is very lamentable is that senior students or students have been practicing for a long time. How many of you have been practicing for more than 10 years? Raise your hand. Nobody? Wow. Wow. How about five years? Okay, so that's, that's the limit then, five years. So you see people, a lot of times I see people practice for 10 years. They sit like stone lions, really good. But they're just accomplished samsaric meditators, like a trained dog. They can sit very, very easily. Sometimes I call that lazy dog chan because they become so accustomed, they can get their mind into a very comfortable place. So when they sit to meditate, they're just like a, a dog on a warm spring day on grass, just lying there not even moving their tail that much, just lying there. They feel so comfortable. Click, click, ding. It doesn't matter to them. They, they can get up and stretch and move around and then go back and sit again. But they've become so used to this, they lost that ability to really sincerely practice. Every once in a while, I run into a lazy dog, Chan person, that somehow I'm able to reawaken them, a renaissance of that person. And it pushes them to a point where they'd never seen before because they'd never had the chance to run into a well-known advisor. And in that moment, they can practice very well. They put in all the time. They just have to regenerate the, 
the power. What uh, Master Han Shan said that you have to use derive power from your power. What is this deriving power from your power? It is the your own innate intrinsic power of the mind. Believe me, to create a place like this, the whole world, the whole universe, this is not something that Steven Spielberg can do or anybody can, can make up. It takes a lot of power to create something like this. A lot. Power that you cannot gain from your own, your own body. But the mind power is very great. I always use as evidence of this Master Shen Ying. He was already old. And he came to the U.S. and started presenting things. And yet simultaneously was in Taiwan. In a course of a few years... He, he built an incredible university and complex and chapters of Dharma Drum all over the place. His power was able to mobilize several thousand people in all directions. Of writing how many books, I don't know if you're aware of how many books he'd written, but they could fill this entire wall easily. That power doesn't come from an individual, it comes from mine. And this is what we use. So when you run into somebody that is just content on where they're at, because they go, next lifetime, I'll, I'll, I'll try some more. But in this lifetime, they still have a chance. And I'm able to revive some of those old dogs. And, and they're doing well. Never be content at where you're at. The thing that amazes me about mind is is always expanding, always changing. I never say, I understand mind, I see mind, I do that. I just practice. That's all. That's what you should do. Now, that's like a preface to what I was going to talk about. And again, can't you guys just stay for like 30 days? <laughs> I'll give you a, two things. One, a money-back guarantee. Okay, so if you, you don't like it after 30 days, we give you your money back. I have to check with the monastics about that. <laughs> the other one is lifetime guarantee. A lifetime guarantee. If you don't get it, in 30 days, you still have next lifetime to come back and try again. <laughs> I want to read to you and go move very quickly through this material to give you a feeling of the spirit of Chan and Ekayana, this, this one mind, to kind of give you a flavor for what the masters throughout the years were, were talking about. This is Master Bo Shan. And... Um, Master Beauchamp was a later master uh, from the 16th century. But um, this is from the Shifu's book, Attaining the Way, which I strongly recommend that you, you, you get. Okay. And this book's almost falling apart. And, uh, but I'm holding it together. I had actually already given it to one of my students, but I asked her to give it back to me so I could go on a retreat because I couldn't find another copy of it. And I haven't given it back to her, but hopefully there'll be something left when I give it back to her, because all the pages are falling apart. This is what beginning Chan practitioners should know. At the very outset of the practice, arise the aspiration to break through the mind of birth and death. This mind that you have is the mind of birth and death. Where does that come from? Huh? Mine, but it comes from the first teaching of Shakyamuni Buddha. Right here, Master Boshan is going right to the very first teaching, the 12 Nadanas or 
the law of dependent origination, how everything comes into being. And so he's saying, right from the very beginning, you should arouse an aspiration, an interest. You want to break through this. There are two deaths. One is the little death, meaning this, this death now, because it's not really a death, because first of all, you're illusory. Second of all, you come back. That's why you get Gilbert's lifetime guarantee. <laughs> okay, and it's transferable to the next lifetime. But this is a little, the great death is seeing beyond samsara, seeing that all of this is a dream. That's the great death. But here he's saying, break through this mind of birth and death. This is an, an illusory mind. With determined resolve, see through the universe, the body, the mind, and realize everything is coming together of provisional conditions without substantial self. You cannot discover the original great principle that is within you, if you cannot discover, is within you, the mind of birth and death will never be shattered. When the mind of birth and death is not shattered, the slain ghost of impermanence will continue without end to slay each and every thought haunting you. How will you ever stop it? Just take a single thought of shattering the, the mind of birth and death, like a tile that knocks down a gate. You should be like someone in the, in the midst of a raging fire wanting to escape. So you, you hear in the Chan liturgy, it says you should practice as if your head was aflame. Well, if your heads were aflame right now, besides screaming, wouldn't you want to practice the best you could? Because you understand it's a fleeting moment. So we have to have this kind of a conviction. I'm not advocating, Gilbert didn't say, pour oil on your head, light it on fire, and practice. I'm just telling you that's where you're at right now. You just don't understand it. That's why he says this ghost of impermanence will be upon you. There's a lot here, but I have to, to just edit it quite a bit. And this is when I was talking about the old dog Chan, where he says, in the course of practice, the most fearful thing is to settle into a state of stagnation and attach to quiescence, becoming dry and lifeless, unknowing, ignorant, and detesting activity while taking pleasure in quietude. That's why I see many practitioners, they can sit like that, but they go nowhere. And every once in a while, I can salvage one of them and get them moving again. And, it, and it's very amazing when they do that because all of a sudden the light turns on again and, and they're making up for lost time. In the course of the practice, when you look up and you do not see the sky, when you look down and do not see the ground, when you do not see the mountains when looking at the mountains, or water or when looking at water, not knowing you are walking when you are walking, not knowing you are sitting when you are sitting, in the midst of a thousands and millions of people, not a single person is perceived throughout your whole being inside out. There's only this massive doubt, uh, sensation, even when the world is completely chaotic. Vow not to rest until your mind will shatter this massive doubt. This is the most important thing in practicing. He's referring to the Huato practice, but also in the practice of side illumination. The side illumination comes at it from a more passive way, but one should have a doubt about this world, one should not just simply dismiss when I say that this world is a dream. It is a dream. We, we don't, 
We don't know that because we tap on something. We say, oh, that's firm. So that has to be real. But in a dream, you know, if you're being chased by a demon, you, you're running as fast as you can, right? You'll run right off the bed to escape the demon because you think it's real. And we don't understand that. We take this world to be real and mind to be unreal, but it's the opposite way. So we have to constantly be, be checking and seeing which eye is perceiving. In the course of the practice, do not fear that in death you will not live. Instead, fear of living without having experienced the great death. If you can fasten yourself to the doubt, there will be no need to leave behind motion and stillness. They will depart by themselves. There is no need to purify the deluded mind. The deluded mind will purify itself. At that time, the gates of the six roots will naturally be expansively open like empty space. Touch it and you'll arrive. Call it and it will respond. Why worry about not living? In, in this way, what he's talking about is there's two types of practice. Um, yesterday I talked about the shortcut and the other practice. One practice is that we abide by the six paramitas, the five precepts, 37 factors of enlightenment, the eightfold path, and we live our life perfecting that practice. This is the second level of practice, not the first level. Sometimes I refer to this as trying to build a staircase to heaven or a stairway to heaven. It sounds like it could be a great song. But, but in any case, it's the stairway to heaven. We're trying to climb out of samsara. Can we do that? What we'll do is we'll just end up in a glass ceiling above us, hitting against it. I want out. I'm perfect. I want out. No, you can't go that way. But you will be a great samsara sentient being. But you cannot escape in this way. Eventually, that kind of a practice will bring you about to a realization that those things are not there. It was very funny because I read in one sutra where one bodhisattva was told of the shortcut. And he went, I practiced from nine kalpas to get here. And you're telling me that I could have gotten here with a snap of the fingers? I wasted nine kalpas. A very interesting response, right? But it's there in the sutra so that we can see how to practice, how truly to practice. The shortcut is to know that all phenomena is created by the mind. All phenomena is created by the mind. And we can um, see that clearly. Now, I haven't talked about this for a long time. Maybe some students might have heard this before. If you have, don't give the response. But I have a, a puzzle for you. Imagine that there's this giant milk bottle and you pay, place a gooseling inside the bottle. And you see that? Like a little goose, little tiny feathers and stuff. And you feed it and water it and clean the bottle all the time. Until this goosely, now it's become a goose. And it's stuck in the bottle. Now it's very difficult because 
it cannot move very much, so you have a concern for the gooseling. Now it's no longer a goose. It's a goose, not a gooseling. How do you get that goose out of the bottle? It cannot go through the top because it's too small. You could pull it out, but you'd have this worm goose. Not very nice. How do you get that goose out of the bottle without harming the goose or breaking the bottle? How do you do that? Anybody have an idea? Nobody? So this example even predated you? You know, okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, thanks for not mentioning it. Because it's important because you have to try to think. How do you get it out? Do you know how to get it out? Poor goose. <laughs> Anybody? Nobody know how you get it out. I only had one person that understood and immediately answered, and she was a what they call an indigo child, a child that has special skills, special visions. And she immediately got it. The answer, the goose is out of the bottle. Huh? You put the goose in the bottle, didn't you? You put the goose in this bottle. I said, imagine you have a goose in a bottle. <laughs> Right? You put the goose in the bottle. Your goose is in this bottle because you put it there. But the you is not you. The you is mind. Since it's mind, mind is all powerful. Poof. You're out of the bottle. It's like that. The only catch you have to leave the bottle and the goose behind. Mind is free. Doesn't cost you anything. It's free, liberated. This is what they call liberation. You're out of that bottle. You put your illusory goose body into that bottle. And you believe it to be real. We don't understand these things. We don't understand how mind works. It's difficult for us. But if you understand the potential of the mind, it's very incredible. There is a sutra that says, Five billion Buddha worlds, okay, five billion, give or take a few billion, can, can um, uh, be placed on the single strand of the Buddha's hair without looking like a fat piece of hair, without any protrusion. It would be just as if I put five billion worlds on this bar and you would not know that they were there. You would just see the bar. How does that happen? Is that what the Taiwanese say, blowing the cow, making things up? Making it bigger than it is? How does that happen? Let me give you one more exercise. Imagine that you have a brown wooden bowl, kind of that they go begging with the mendicants going, can you give me some food? You have that bowl. Imagine it. Can you see the, the wooden bowl? And imagine that in that bowl there is a walnut. You all know what a walnut is, right? It's just a nut, almost like the shape of a uh, 
an American buffalo, a bison. And just imagine that that walnut is inside that bowl. You see it? And then imagine that that um, walnut turns into a buffalo, a big brown buffalo in the bowl. Can you see the buffalo in the bowl? Try to use your mind to see the buffalo in the bowl. And imagine that buffalo becomes the size, it becomes Mount Sumeru, the famous Buddha Mark mountain. So in, incredibly big, all fitting into this, this bowl. Can you see the mountain in the bowl? This is mind. What we believe is impossible just happened. That this mountain fits in this brown bowl and fits in your head. Now you know why people say, oh, she has a big head. Because <laughs> you have this giant mountain in there. How can that be? Because mind is not limited to samsaric measurements. We don't understand that. We can't because we are a creation of mind. When we let go of that and we use mind, it's infinite. These are just little practices for you so that you can begin to develop the, the, the practice of mind. You practice mind, not ego. When you consider your own mind as the Buddha, that is genuine faith. See, I didn't make this up. When you consider your own mind as the Buddha, that's genuine faith. That's why I say you have to have faith in the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. You must personally verify this and put it to practice until you have no qualms about it, until you're clear about it. So you are constantly verifying this mind is the Buddha mind. This mind, you put it into practice. So you do that. The, the Christians, they always have this thing, kind of like a guilty thing. When they would go, you know, you're seeing that there's a box there, but only has one donut in it left. And then they'd say, what would Jesus do? he'd probably fill the box up again. Sorry, that's a... <laughs> would he take that donut, that last donut? Or would he do the thing that most of you do? I'm just gonna take half of it. And then say, who left this half a donut here? Well, I left it for you. Or where's just a little piece of it? But we, we're always abiding in the Buddha mind. And we choose the Buddha mind moment to moment to moment. This is our practice. It does not matter whether you're sitting on the cushion or you're walking around. Choose the Buddha mind. You go look at the donut and go, I've already had three. I don't really need this last donut. I'll leave it for another Buddha to come that's more hungrier than me. If you seek the Dharma outside your own mind, that is specious 
faith. That means the, a faith of very little value. You must personally verify this and put it to practice until you have no qualms about it. This is genuine faith, but if you have the slightest skepticism about this, even though you say that the mind is Buddha, you have not personally come to know your own mind. And then it's heretical uh, faith, meaning that it's not, not true faith. And um, so Chan Master Huang Bo once said, relinquishing the dust of vexations is no ordinary matter. You must practice religiously like fastening a tight knot on a rope. If you have not endured the bone-chilling winter, how can you expect the smell of the scent of sweet blossoms? These words are most intimate to us. If at all times you admonish yourself with these words, you will naturally have practiced well. To give up our worldly desires, our worldly vexations is not an easy matter. Because of the habitual tendencies, you feel like you're a fish swimming up the river, like it's counterintuitive, until one day there's a tilting point, and all of a sudden you see it in the reverse order. To, to give in to selfish notions is counterintuitive. It is then when you come to know your own mind, your true mind. And what he's talking about is this, about the smell of plum blossoms. It was about one master that practiced an entire winter, a very bitter winter in a solitary retreat of Biguan. He was in the retreat for the whole winter by himself. And then one day at the beginning of spring, from outside, he could smell the, the plum blossoms on the tree. So his mind was so still, he was able to smell this faint smell of the plum blossoms. And so it is what we say that we direct our practice in a sincere way. And we tie the knot tight, fasten it, making sure. If you were going to go mountain climbing, would you not want to be sure of how to tie a knot? I mean, you're not just going to do any kind of a knot, right? Uh, like some people, I oh, will just keep going this way and this way and this way. You have to know the right type of knot to use and make sure it's tight. Why? Because your life depends on it. Here, more than your life depends on it, your great death depends on it. And you go, well, that sounds like pretty depressing. No, I don't want to die. Of course you don't want to die. That's why you live, and that's why you die. But when you penetrate through, you can see that there was never any birth and death. That was an illusion. But you have to practice in this way. So this analogy that he uses is an important one because he also uses it to discuss how to meditate. And he says, your practice must be taught, impenetrable, integrated, and pervasive. What is a taught practice? Taught means T-A-U-T, means very tight. Like, like um, how many of you are real lazy when you tie your shoelaces? Nobody's going to admit to that. Oh, some, and then what happens in two hours? It comes off, right? And you're, you know, oh gosh. And then you tie it real quickly, right? You don't have time to tie it again. No, you tie it tight. It took me many, many years. I hate to say how many years it was before I realized, try to tie my shoelaces as tight as I can so that they, they don't come undone. They still come undone. That's just the nature of them. But I don't, I'm not walking around like a, a little kid anymore. Sorry, I'm not. But I'm not walking around like a little kid, you know, with their shoelaces untied. So... It has to be tight. When we practice the meditation, we have to hold on to our method. We can't let these extraneous thoughts take center stage in the mind. In the, in the mind, we just have the method, and it is there 
and we use that method, then other thoughts come in. I really want to buy that purse, or I want to buy that car, or I want to buy a puppy, or I, I want to go here, I want to go there. And then the method is off. And now you're looking at the puppy, the car, whatever it is. What happened? Because it, your practice was not taught. It was not pervasive. The entire mind must be filled with the method. Don't let thoughts arise. One master said, the crime is not in thoughts arising. Why? Because it's natural that thoughts will arise in the mind. It's natural. We put them there, so they're going to come up. He said, the crime is not knowing early enough that they have arisen. So the thoughts will come up naturally, but our crime is not seeing that these thoughts have arisen and have taken center stage. So we no longer see the, uh, uh, the method, it's gone. It's been replaced by a puppy. So you traded your method for a puppy, an illusory puppy to boot. But that's what you did because that attracted you more, so much for your practice. So, hold on a second. Because this is part encouragement and part scaring you. Let me see if I can find it here. Master Ling Chi has something to say about this. But Master Ling Chi, he was saying that uh, when students today fail to make progress, today that was like in the 700 BC, not BC, uh, CE, um, fail to make progress, where's their fault? The fault lies in the fact that they do not have faith in themselves. If you do not have faith in yourself, you are forever hurrying along, keeping up with everything around you. You'll be twisted and turned by whatever the environment you're in, and you can never move freely. You're tied to these habitual patterns. But if you can just stop this mind that goes around rushing around moment to moment looking for something, like you ever see a dog that's on the loose and he's <laughs> You go over here, he's smelling over here, smelling he this post over here and wherever. He's just looking for something, something to eat. Don't eat that. That's like garbage. Well, I like garbage. But they keep going. And you see, the, you see the, them in this way, always looking for something. Then you'll, if you can stop that mind, then you'll be no different than the Buddhas and the patriarchs. It's very interesting because Master Ling she said, do you want to see the Buddhas? How many of you want to see the Buddhas and the patriarchs? Nobody? <laughs> it's not other than you that are listening to me right now. Not bad, right? Pretty good. So you go home and say, what did Gilbert teach you? He said, I'm the Buddha. <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> So please don't go around and find yourself a crown and walk around, <laughs> you know, alms to the Buddha. But it's this Buddha mind that you have. So then he continues, do you, oh, I, actually this is what he says, do you want to get to know the Buddhas and the patriarchs? They're not other than you. The people standing in front of me listening, he made the people stand. Maybe a good idea of me. Maybe I'll have you stand next time. Um, standing in front of me uh, for this lecture. Um, students don't have enough faith in themselves, so they rush around looking for something outside. But even if they get something, all it is is words and phrases and pretty appearances. They'll never get to the living thought of the patriarchs. Now here's the scary part. So he says, make no mistake, you followers of John. You're all followers of John, I presume. If you do not find it in this life, 
Then for a thousand kalpas, not just one kalpa, but a thousand kalpas, you'll be born again and again in this threefold world, the, um, the form realm, no form realm, the realm of desire, which we're in. In this three-form world, you'll be lured off by what you think are favorable environments. You'll be lured off. What he's talking about at this moment is the bardo. Anybody ever hear of the bardo? Raise your hand. The bardo is when, when you die, there's a period of time before you come back. Normally in the Chinese way, they say, you know, by the 49th day or wherever you're going to be, right? But in the bardo, you, you don't have a body, you don't have self. You, there's just the sensations of, of attractions. And in, in this time period, then, this is where the final karma from one life begins and, and, um, and picks up the, the new life. And he says, you'll be lured off and you think you're in favorable environments. You go, oh, this is a nice place to rest. I don't know if any of you have read any stories about the sutra of somebody going in from one lifetime to another, but you go in and you go, oh, this is so nice and comfy here. And, and he says, and be born in the belly of a donkey or a cow. You've got a chance. Don't blow it. They'll say, how do you feel in this lifetime? Moving, move. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's okay. You're a donkey. Oh, what chance do you have to practice? So he's scaring them. He's telling them, don't think that this life as a human being is an automatic for you. You, you may come back differently. Once I was at this one person's house, and uh, this is when I was practicing Qigong, I was giving the, the husband a treatment, a uh, physical treatment. And uh, when I went to the house, interesting Chinese family, and I looked down at the dog, and there was like a little pug dog, you know, with little tiny legs and a big fat face and a big fat body, and little tiny skinny tail. And I go, this dog is interesting. And they go, oh, Fred? And they, I go, that's his name, Fred. And here's a clue. If you, you see an animal with a human name, chances are they came from the human realm before. Okay, so they say, oh, Fred, oh, yeah, he is very strange. He's a vegetarian. <laughs> and I went, really? And he goes, yeah, and he likes to watch TV. <laughs> and, you know, I have two dogs, and maybe if some dog barks on the TV, they might perk up, but other than that, they just ignore the TV, right? So I'm going, all right. So then after I'd given the, the gentleman a treatment, I went to the bathroom to wash my hands and I was going through the living room and there was Fred. And he was on the corner of the couch with one arm up like this and the other one here, looking at the TV. And, and he sees me come in. Don't get in the way. You know, and he was there just like, like an old chubby man sitting there in the corner of the couch watching the TV. So I said, Fred, whatever you did in the last, last lifetime, you have to make up for it in this lifetime. Come back to be a human in the next lifetime. You know, you, you don't belong as a do in the dog realm, you know, in the animal realm. But we don't understand that. We don't see that. You know, and um, it, it's, it's strange. I once, uh, I'm an attorney by degree, and I had this one client that came in, and he was very, very big, and, and his skin was pink, pink, not white, pink. And he had a turned up nose. And I went, oh my God, 
He was a pig in his last lifetime. And sure enough, as we were talking, there was like a family. He was in the middle, and there was two people. He fell asleep. <laughs> and I was so surprised. I was so scared and so sad for him because he didn't understand that. So we see these crossovers like this all the time. You, you just have to be aware of it, and then you can see where people come from. A lot of times when people come, I'm really digressing right now, but it's okay. <laughs> a, a lot of times when you see people that don't like this place, how many don't like to be a human? Raise your hand. <laughs> you don't? Okay. Sometimes. See, he's, at least he's braver than everybody else. I want to raise my hand, too. Um, a lot of times it's because they come from the human realm, or heaven realm. And coming from the heaven realm, they don't like this place. <laughs> because it's, it's, not, uh, it's not desirable to them. It's like slumming. You know, this is not a great place. Even, you know, the, you know why we don't see the aliens here? They just pass by. It's like trick-or-treaters not wanting to go to the crummy house, you know. But the aliens come and say, don't visit there. Those people are crazy. They kill each other. They kill the animals. They kill everything. You know, it's not a good place, and it's polluted. No, so they put an X there. So, you know, don't visit Earth. Okay. But we are so enamored with Earth. We're so enamored with ourself. But... We have to understand the nature of things. When we understand it, then we're able to do it. This is why Master Lin Chi was saying, don't take being a human as a given. You could end up like a, like a cow or, or a donkey. No, you need to practice well. That's what they're... Hold on. Can we... I have a few more minutes. That was like the interlude, the relaxation between what I'm talking about. Um, followers of the way, here and there you hear it, that there is a way to be practiced, a dharma to become enlightened to, Will you tell me then just what dharma there is to be enlightened to and what way there is to practice? Once I was in, in Taiwan and there's a, um, a, a, a very good monk, very good practitioning monk. Uh, his name is Guo Qi. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of him. Um, they call him the Mongolian doctor. He's very dark skinned and he, and he always has this rubber strap that he hits everybody with to make them get better. So if he said, oh, you have a problem on your back, bam, 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 you have a problem here. So once I went to a Dharma drum and I saw people with red marks all over and I go, go cheese here, you know, because <laughs> they all had marks all over them. One lady had marks on the last day and I'm going, how are you gonna go home to your husband? She had like red marks all over her body. And they go, what kind of a place is that? But anyway, I digress again. But I was at, in the office right by the Chan Hall in, in tai, tai, Taiwan, in Jinsong. And, he's, and there was a bunch of university students there, and I was talking to him. And all of a sudden, I heard from the corner, and he said, Gilbert, Gilbert, they say that you're enlightened. Are you enlightened? And so then I just told them, tell him that it's a dream asking a dream about a dream. And this is the way that we look at things like this. We cannot say, I'm enlightened. That would be the last thing I would ever say. And, um, and the thing is just seeing things as they really are. And then we proceeded to talk for a long time. And then he finally said to the students, pay attention because he's talking for your benefit. But it is in this way, we don't think about enlightenment. Anybody that says, I'm enlightened, run away from them, okay? This, 
Somebody who has some kind of realizations or knowings or whatever would never say that. They would, and then people would say, I remember once somebody said, oh, Shifu, you're a great bodhisattva. And Shifu said, you must be a great bodhisattva too. And he goes, no, I'm not. And he says, because only a great bodhisattva would know a great bodhisattva. And so the thing is, is that we don't set ranks. We don't set marks. We don't, we don't do things like that. We are, we are all here, and we just assist each other. There's no reason to put a mark like that on something. It's like trying to mark the ocean. How can you mark the ocean? So that's why he's saying, don't engage in those kinds of things. And he said, uh, in, your, in your present activities, what is it that you lack? What is that practice must mend? Um, but those monks don't understand this and immediately put faith in a bunch of well spirits. He's referring to these monks that really aren't great practitioners. And they put, so they talk about wild spirits. Wild spirits is outer path practice. Um, and these wild fox spirits, there's a story, but I don't have time to tell that right now. And letting them spout their ideas and tying people into knots. When the principle and the practice match one another, proper precaution is taken with regard to the three types of karma of body, mouth, and mind. Only then can one attain Buddhahood. People who go on like this are as plentiful as springtime showers. And so he's, he's saying, you be careful to what you're listening to so that you are, you're, you're clear about it. And you use your own wisdom to, to see this. Um, The true and proper man of the way from the moment to moment never permits any interruption in, um, in his mind. When the great teacher Bodhidharma Dhammo came to the West, he was simply looking for a man who would not be misled by others. Later, the second patriarch encountered Bodhidharma, and after hearing one word, he understood. Then for the first time, he realized that up to then, he had been engaged in useless activity and striving. And then Master Ling Chi is very direct. So he says, my understanding today is no different than the Buddhas and the patriarchs. If you get it with the first phrase, like something that I say to you, he says, then um, you, you can be a teacher of the patriarchs and the Buddhas. If you get it with the second phrase, you can be the teacher of humans and heavenly beings. If you get it with the third phrase, you can't even save yourself. So he's saying, you, you got to really try. Try hard to get this. Try to understand it. Okay. Enough for him for a moment. I think that's it for, for right now. Um, and uh, keep practicing hard. We'll go over this. Again, there's so much material that I want to explain to you, but I just I, I run out of time. But what I try to do is to give you something, but not make it so thick that your head feels like this when you leave here. I want you to have inspiration to practice and, and practice in, in the proper way. So you develop bodhicitta. You know, the true bodhicitta is something that you have, you know, I, I remember telling Shifu, I said, Shifu, if you do not deliver me first, I will deliver you. And it was sincere that I said that because this is the Bodhi heart. He just smiled. He understood what I was saying because it, it's just this way that we all help each other. There's no rank. We are, are just practicing. If you practice in the right way, if you follow the instruction that I gave um, this morning, your practice will be very fulfilling. In the afternoon, we're going to have um, interviews, and in those interviews, you'll have a chance to ask me questions about your practice, okay? And so uh, think of the questions that you have, or think of something that, in terms of the experience or what was happening so that 
I can uh, talk to you about it and um, gently guide you, you know, in, in a way that will, will help you. Remember, any time that a well-known advisor, a teacher, a master uh, corrects you, you should rejoice because you're that much closer to a better practice. Always think in this way, okay? And, and you will do well, okay?